sweet promise is given to all who believe. Behold, I come quickly, mine own to receive. Hold fast till I come, the danger is great. Sleep not as do others, be watchful and wait. Welcome to Bible Talk Class. We are continuing our presentation on the book of Revelation. It's a seminar, as we indicated in our previous presentation. And we are continuing here with hermeneutics of the book of Revelation, guidelines for interpreting the book of Revelation. Let's start. The first item you look at um, in this segment is genre. Genre. The book is a different book. It belongs to the genre of apocalyptic literature. And so we want to look at what that means. Throughout human history, God's interventions to assure his people of his great salvation are evident in scripture. He has a particular way of assuring, giving assurance to his people when in crisis. Among others, he uses signs, symbols known to his people in crisis to convey the message of hope. The book of Daniel was written in such a circumstance when God's people were in crisis. God revealed many things to Daniel to assure his people and he used symbols or signs. God communicated his eternal truth using predominantly different symbolic images in the book of Daniel. Apart from Daniel, several OT books such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, and Zechariah contain some symbolic imageries. And so it's not only in Daniel that we find this way that God communicates his assuring words to his people. Among other features, this mode of communication that is using symbols to communicate a hopeful message gave birth to a literary genre. Genre known as apocalyptic texts. Genre simply means kind of writing, kind of a text. And so when you say apocalyptic text, what you are saying is that it's a message revealed in symbolic fashion by God through other worldly beings to a seer, to one who sees visions or who is given the privilege to see visions, to assure his people in crisis of his ultimate intervention and save them into eternal happiness and judge their oppressors. The intertestamental period saw a growth of apocalypticism and produced numerous works as follows. And so after Daniel, Ezekiel, Isaiah, and the rest had written um, messages full of symbols that God used to communicate his hopeful message. We find several books written during the intertestamental period, mimicking this style of writing in biblical times. Now the following here is interesting to note. The book of the Watchers, that is the first Enoch chapters 1 to 36, written in 3rd century BC. The similitudes of Enoch, also written in the 1st century AD. The book of the heavenly luminaries, um, written in 3rd century BC. The book of dream visions, 2nd century BC. The apocalypse of weeks, 2nd century BC. The testament of Abraham, 1st century to 2nd century AD. Dead Sea Scrolls, the war scroll. 1st century BC, Apocalypse of Sephania, 1st century BC um, and 1st century AD. Second Enoch, late 1st century BC, Second Esdras, and here we are looking at 180. Second Baruch, late 1st century AD. And so these are the books that mimic this style of writing. Now, characteristics of apocalyptic literature, in other words, all the writings that belong to this form of uh, uh, communication, 
have the following uh, features that should be noted. So anytime you want to determine whether a book is apocalyptic or not, you must consider these. A, dualism. And dualism simply refers to the struggle between good and evil and is well painted in such writings. Otherworldly beings. You see other beings that do not belong to um, the earth. They are not physical. They are spiritual. They look different. And so we'll say they are supernatural beings. They are also in this form of uh, you know, writing. Otherworldly genies. You see that the seer or the prophet is called into a different world. And the seer can be here. And the spirit will be, let's say, in America or in uh, Rwanda or in Nigeria or in China or in the Philippines. And so that's what you find with these uh, writings. We see also visions and signs. Visions and signs are uh, prevalently uh, used in these writings. Timeline events. Some events are timed. Time has been allotted to certain events or certain figures. And eventual divine triumph over the enemies. That's a picture you see also. Apart from Daniel and Revelation, the literature are pseudonymous. In other words, the intertestamental, uh, you know, uh, apocalyptic uh, writings are pseudonymous, meaning we don't know who wrote them. They were written falsely. I would say falsely in a sense that they gave different names um, for the writings. And so the actual people who wrote these uh, books are not known. The book of Revelation is predominantly apocalyptic for its use of symbols. Of course, as in the Old Testament, Mark chapter 13 and, and parallels and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 share some apocalyptic language. So it's not only in Revelation that we see apocalyptic language or some features of apocalypticism uh, you know, used. And therefore, um, we can also consider uh, other, other books in the New Testament as mentioned here, as apocalyptic. Now, the word apocalyptic comes from the Greek apocalypsis, which means unveiling. Actually, apocalypsis comes from two words, namely, apo. Apo means away from. And then kalypto, uh, meaning hide. And so when you put the two together, it means unveiling, uncovering. The question is, what is unveiled by God? In the book of Revelation, God unveils what he does daily in the lives of his people to protect them from the deception of the devil and his ultimate redemptive plan for the faithful. The devil is pictured as a defeated foe as Christ is manifestly painted as the king of kings and the one who reigns forever. Revelation is a gospel, good news for the faithful and bad news for those who continue to side with the devil in their daily choices. The book of Revelation is evidently an apocalyptic. Revelation chapter 1 verse 1, it says the revelation of Jesus. And so the Greek is apocalypsis of Jesus. So it's apocalyptic. Now it's also prophetic. Chapter 1, verse 3, makes clear that the message is about what is soon to take place. And so what is soon to take place is prophetic because it is futuristic. And it's also a message that is assuring God's people. So it's prophetic. And the message also, or the book also, is epistolary. In other words, um, has epistolary features. In short, chapter 1, verse 4, indicates that this book, or the message, was to be sent to seven churches in Asia. And because we have the formula to the churches in uh, Asia, then the book in entirety is an epistle. So these are the three main genres. Of course, the book itself is apocalyptic, and that is there's no doubt about that. But we can also see prophetic and epistolary features in the book. The book bears the mark of an apocalypse, that is, unveiling what must soon take place, prophetic, and epistle because it was primarily intended for believers in Asia. Let's now move on to a very interesting uh, episode here. 
And here we are looking at traditional methods of interpretation. We have talked about genre. We are looking at the hermeneutics. Now, before we begin to interpret this book, let's appreciate how some over the years have interpreted this book. And there are four traditional methods of interpretation of Revelation. Four methods have been used to interpret the book of Revelation relative to the fulfillment of the prophecies of the book. So these methods are used to help assess um, the nature of the fulfillment of the prophecies of this book. Each of these methods arose in response to the relevance of the prophetic nature of the book. How should the prophecies in the book be viewed or understood? These methods attempt to argue about the nature of the fulfillment of the prophecies. The methods include preterism, idealism, futurism, and historicism. Let's begin to look at them as individual methods. Preterism. The word preterism comes from the Latin pratei, meaning past. Generally, preterism teaches that fulfillment of prophecies of the Olivet Discourse and revelation occurred at the destruction of Jerusalem, and that revelation was a response to Emperor Nero's persecution. And so that is how preterists interpret all the prophecies in Revelation. And they see a relationship between Jesus' prophecy in the book of Matthew, for example, chapter 24, and uh, that of Revelation. As early as 3rd century AD, Eusebius of Caesarea and others expressed some preterist view because they needed to understand Revelation and they felt that everything pointed to the destruction of Jerusalem. Luis de Alcázar, a Spanish Jesuit friar of Seville, responded to the Protestants' reference to the papacy as the Antichrist. When the Protestants identified the uh, papacy as the Antichrist, according to Revelation, then Luis de Alcalda also responded by formalizing this method called preterism. Alcalda is credited with an extensive exposition on the methodology of preterism in assessing the eschatological view of Revelation. Now, there are two kinds of preterist interpretation. Let's look at them. The first one is partial preterism. This view holds that the majority of eschatological prophecies, such as the destruction of Jerusalem, Great Tribulation, and the Day of the Lord, fulfilled in AD 70 or during Nero's persecution. But the parousia, second coming of Christ, the resurrection of the dead, and the final judgment are yet to occur. And therefore, there's a big gap between the, um, the fulfillment that took place in the first century and the full fulfillment of prophecy that will take place uh, you know, when Jesus comes and events that will follow. Full preterism teaches that the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and or the fall of the pagan Rome fulfilled all eschatological prophecies in the book of Revelation. And so we are not supposed to expect any fulfillment uh, in the book of Revelation in our time or even the future. Let's evaluate this approach. The book of Revelation had some relevance for the first century Christians, and that's correct because chapters 1 to 3 uh, tell us that uh, the seven churches received a message from Christ. And so, in first, we see some relevance here. However, there was no empire-wide persecution before Domitian reign, and therefore, when they tie the prophecies of this book to Nero's persecution, then it's not correct. The dating of the book weakens the full preterist view, as I've already mentioned, so you can review that in our previous video. The sequential play of the seven seals and trumpets leave no breaks between the time of writing and the consummated eschatological period portrayed in the book. When you look at the seven seals and the seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, you don't see any break. You don't see any break between seals, first seal, second seal. You don't see actual break 
So you can see that events that are associated with the breaking of the seals or the blowing of the trumpets happen sequentially and there are no breaks. And therefore, we are not supposed to see any uh, break uh, between prophecies. Prophecies will continue to happen in their sequential order. The next one is idealism, also known as allegorical approach. Idealism seeks to view all the imageries in Revelation as symbolic. In other words, what we should uh, appreciate about the prophecies in Revelation is that um, they only depict struggle um, between good and evil. Christian humanists in the Renaissance period challenged the view that the kingdom of God had been established on earth. Rather, according to them, the kingdom should be viewed as representing the general improvement of society for the benefit of individuals, not as political or physical establishment. And so we should not look for any physical fulfillment of any prophecies pointing to any physical establishment or human establishment, but we should rather look at the uh, improvement in, in people's life as, um, as well present, represented by the book of Revelation. And so we should look at Revelation in a more positive light. Idealism does not see any literal fulfillment of, of any prophecies in the past, present, or future, but an ongoing conflict between good and evil. F.D. Morris and Karl Barth are chief proponents of idealism. Evaluation The book of Revelation has principles which are relevant for every Christian period in view of the great controversy and a stress on present day events. And that's correct. The principles are good to note. However, idealism denies the prophetic character of the books. Idealism downplays the historicity of the prophetic fulfillment of events associated with the book, but still identifies the beast as imperialism, capitalism, and the like. If you are saying that we should not look for any physical fulfillment of any prophecy, then you do not identify the beast in Revelation as imperialism. Imperialism is a human establishment and therefore is physical, it's not spiritual. We look at futurism. Futurism holds that Revelation chapters 4 to 22 point to future events which will take place just before and after the coming of Jesus. Manuel Lacunza and Francisco Rivera two Catholic Jesuits introduce this approach. Futurist interpretation posits that there will be resurrection of the dead and a rapture of the living before the coming of God's kingdom. And we must also stress that these um, uh, Catholic Jesuits did or presented this uh, approach in response to the Protestant uh, identification of, of papacy as the Antichrist. Its proponents believe that there will be a seven-year literal period of tribulation when the church will be persecuted. Three views are bound as to the time of the rapture of the saints will occur. Since there is this view that before Jesus comes, there will be a secret rapture or some form of rapture. Um, and so uh, this view seems to uh, hang on the idea that we should not bother so much about prophecies fulfilling today. We should rather look forward to the future events that will immediately precede the second coming. And one of the events uh, will be the rapture. So there are three views on the rapture among those who um, subscribe to futurism. A. Pre-tribulationists believe that the saints will be raptured before the tribulation begins. In other words, there will be time of trouble um, in this world. And so before the time of trouble um, uh, comes, um, the saints will be raptured so that they will not suffer any uh, trouble that God will bring upon human beings. Mid-tribulationists hold that rapture of the saints takes place in the first half of the seven-year period just to avoid the worst part of God's wrath. post Traditionalists, third, believe that the saint will meet Christ in the clouds and return with Christ to the earth. Note here that those who hold these views agree that the saints 
or return of Christ at the end after the tribulation. Note again, the futurists hold that the seven-year tribulation will begin when Israel sign a peace treaty with the Antichrist, the revived Roman Empire. And so that's another uh, you know, uh, view that uh, they all hold. Note again, the traditionalists subscribe to the various interpretation of the millennium in Revelation chapter 20 as follows. You can see that it is becoming complicated. Some of the futurists believed in pre-millennialism, and this view holds that Christ will come, bind Satan, reign 1,000 years on earth or heaven as Jerusalem is capital. The amillennialism refers to a non-literal period between Christ's ascension and the parousia, or otherwise called the church age. The third one is post-millennialism. Here, it is believed that Christ will return after the 1,000 literal years, in which the whole world would have been Christianized and experienced peace through social economic reforms. Let's evaluate this approach. It is true that the book of Revelation indeed presents future events that will immediately occur before and after the parousia. That is true. However, Futurism downplays the historical and contemporary relevance of the prophetic events painted in the book for the church. Futurism employs a atomistic approach in applying prophetic statement to the fulfillment of future events. In fact, when it comes to the interpretation or the view of uh, rapture, um, you don't really find any clear passage from scripture that teaches this secret rapture thing. And that there will be a time that will be trouble and the saints will be raptured before the trouble starts or in the middle of the trouble then the saints will be uh, raptured or they will be raptured after the trouble and then they will go to heaven and they will return uh, to the earth with Christ. You don't have any clear passage from scripture teaching that and so that is a bit atomistic. In other words, they pick any passage from anywhere without uh, considering the context. The next one is historicism. Historicism holds that the book of Revelation portrays a progressive fulfillment of prophecies beginning from the apostolic period to the end of earth history. The timeline of events as prophesied are identified within the Western world and the Christian church. And so that is how uh, you know, prophecies are viewed, uh, and more or less from the Western perspective. The book of Revelation is viewed as a continuation of the book of Daniel. And so that's how Revelation is studied. Historicist readings of Revelation revise the identification of persons, events, and meanings of the symbolic representation as new figures and events emerge. This means that today an individual will be identified as the sea beast because of his or her. Uh, you know, uh, actions. And the next day, you find a different figure with similar or same action, and that person will also be identified with the same image in Revelation, like, say, the sea beast. And so, that's the problem, I will not say the problem, but that's how this approach uh, works. So, uh, different people can be identified with the same image in the book of Revelation. And that is how uh, things work with this approach. The reformers use this approach to identify the papacy as the Antichrist, which resulted in the introduction of Lutherism and Vicharism. Evaluation the book, the book of Revelation indeed presents future events from the apostolic period, that is from the apostles' time, and that its relevance is without break till the end of time. In other words, prophecies have been fulfilling from the time of the apostles and will continue to fulfill till Christ comes and afterwards. However, historicism is more allegorical in nature than symbolic. What this means is that they do not look at the general symbolic presentation of an event. Rather, they look at the details of the events presented in symbolic fashion 
and try to look for meanings for each item in the uh, symbolic presentation of an event. And that is problematic because sometimes they are not able to take care of all the details in the presentation. They just pick some that are of interest and leave the rest. Historicism is inconsistent in its application of the symbolic meanings as new figures emerge. Like I explained, today um, is this person is identified with the sea beast, tomorrow a different person, but that same person is identified with the sea beast, and so the inconsistency is too much with this um, approach. Historicism looks more like stomach direction approach. I call this because as new situation emerges, then you know new interpretation has to be uh, developed or cooked so that revelation can make sense for um, the contemporary uh, readers. Historicism is more Western oriented than the book attests as global. The book seems to have a global perspective, and therefore um, interpreting revelation through the Western uh, history um, is not helping the world to really appreciate Revelation as belonging or concerning um, the history of the world. And therefore, it's important to uh, be aware of this flaw. Okay. And so these are the traditional methods of interpretation of Revelation. Now let's move on to principles that should guide us as we interpret Revelation in this seminar. First, or A, is analyze the historical, contemporary, and future relevance of the book. Take your time and know the historical context in which this book was written and see how we can apply to our world today and also uh, for future generation. We will try to distinguish between the meanings associated with expressions, the things which are in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, and take place after these things. Revelation chapter 1, verse 19b, and chapter 4, verse 1. We will explain what these expressions uh, mean as we interpret Revelation. But what is of importance uh, to note here is that the things which are refer to the situation of the seven churches in their world, and the things that should take place after these things, are the things that will concern not only the seven churches, but the church in history and the church that will continue to exist till the coming of Jesus and beyond. The distinction between allegorical interpretation and symbolic interpretation. And here we mean that when it comes to allegorical interpretation, we pay attention to details that we find in a story. And every item, every individual, every event in the story should have a meaning. But when it comes to symbolic interpretation, we don't do that. We look at what the whole story is communicating, just a message. And so that is what we should uh, consider as we interpret the book of Revelation. Understand that the message of the book was to be heard as symbolically dramatic pictorial and understood, Revelation chapter 1, verse 3, makes clear that the audience were to hear the message. And as they were hearing the message, um, they should picture, because the message is dramatic, dramatic. And so they have to picture uh, the scenes and not to spend so much time in looking for detailed corresponding meanings. Um, of certain things, certain individuals, certain this, um, that, and all that. If they do that, they'll miss the point. And so that's why the message has to be heard, even today. Know that the language belongs to the world of the primary audience. The language of this book does not belong to our world. So we must understand the language that was used to communicate the, uh, the message. Um, from the perspective of the immediate audience and the author. Know the sources of symbols used in Revelation. The Old Testament is well alluded to in Revelation, quoted many times in Revelation. And therefore, the language used to communicate this eternal truth in Revelation 
more than half comes from the Old Testament, and therefore we must know the symbols used as borrowed from the Old Testament so that we can interpret Revelation well. We must also know the certain in Asia Minor, certain symbolic images are taken from the Asia Minor context, social, political context, religious context. And so once we understand these contexts, we will be able to understand certain images used in the book that actually reflect the cultural, social, religious um, setting of the people that this uh, message was addressed to. Apocalyptic world is important that we appreciate the language of apocalypticism. Why? Because we know that in the Old Testament and the intertestamental period, this way of writing using symbols and other features that we have mentioned became apparently uh, important in communicating hopeful messages. And therefore, some images are also borrowed from other apocalyptic writings, and therefore it's important to know how these images were used in those writings so that we can understand Revelation better because the same worldview is shared in these writings and therefore we, we can be helped as we understand these symbols used in apocalyptic world. The New Testament. New Testament serves as a springboard for us to understand the book of Revelation. Why? Because Jesus was born into this world and after he ascended to heaven, we see in Revelation that we see Jesus who has ascended to heaven and seated on the throne. And so without his coming to this world, the ascension will not make sense. And therefore, it's important to understand what the New Testament uh, you know, says about uh, Jesus and his ministry so that we can understand Revelation better and his role in the book of Revelation. Next is that we apply the principles for interpreting subgenres in Revelation, such as narrative, poetry, riddles, and the like. There are several sub-genres, uh, like narrative, poetry, riddles, um, and others that uh, are in Revelation. And the principles that you have learned on how to interpret narrative, stories, poetry, uh, riddles, and the like should be applied here so that we can understand them. Sometimes when you hear a song sung in Revelation, we should not interpret the song line by line and then look at the meaning for each word and all that. It's a song. It's poetic. And how do we interpret poetry? We must follow the principles that we have already studied in our Hermeneutics class. And that will help us to um, understand Revelation better. Determine the significance of numerology in the book. The use of numbers. Pay attention to author or the revelator's interpretation of symbols. There are several places that the author um, interpret some symbols. And so once we get the interpretation from the author, we don't need to worry ourselves of any other uh, you know, uh, meanings of, of these symbols. We just stick to what the author has done for us. Beware that the personalities in the visions have assumed roles that may not be consistent with their real form and state. Hence, they may be conceived as dramatic visionary characters. Compare other visionary scenes of such uh, you know, uh, characters. And so the point here we are stressing is that when you look at Revelation, you see one figure like Jesus. In Revelation chapters um, 1 to 3, he appears as resurrected Jesus, very powerful, beautiful in appearance. And then in chapter 4, he appears as, as a lamb. And in chapter 19, he appears as one sitting on a, on, a, on a horse. And he described as a lamb. We can see different figures used in Revelation. They appear in different forms and they can change their forms depending on the role they play in a particular vision. And so it's important not to say that this is how you see this person, when we are to go to heaven, we are come to the earth. The church is represented uh, by uh, candle six. The challenges are represented by uh, stars. In reality, are they stars? No, they are human beings. And so we must not try to um, say that what you see in vision corresponds to reality. And that's the point you want to stress. Be mindful that the roles that such characters play may be the prime concern of the revelator, but not their identity. Note, this is important, that's why I'm putting note here. The interpretive principle 
for symbolic and parabolic tests is the same, for they are all dramatic. The difference is that a parable is heard while a symbol is visualized. And this the point here is that the way we interpret parable should be the same way we interpret symbolic presentations. So the book of Revelation should be seen as a parable. In other words, the visions, the dramatic uh, presentation of events should be seen as parables and that we should interpret them as we would interpret uh, uh, parables. We usually look for a single meaning that a story conveys. Unless the context suggests otherwise that we should use allegorical interpretation, if not, we stick to one single meaning that the story conveys. And this is the approach that I think we can uh, use to interpret um, the book of Revelation. Note again, in the apocalyptic language, we may consider the numbers as human language, best to express a characteristic identity of a figure or a non-permanence of an event, but not necessarily a determination of beginning and an end of an action. In other words, numbers, how to interpret numbers in Revelation, it's important to note here that time is limited to the expression of human setting. It's only human setting that we appreciate time, that time defines um, the extent um, at which something occurs or the duration that something uh, takes place. Now, number associated with a figure may be functional and characteristic. And so number may not necessarily communicate beginning and end point of something, specific beginning point, specific end point, but only to characterize this figure. In other words, you can have one figure that a particular number is used for. Let's say figure A, you see number three is used for figure, figure A. Figure B, number two is used for figure, figure B consistently. So you can see that anytime you see number three, remember figure A. Anytime you see figure number two, remember figure B. And so that is the point I think we can also consider as we interpret numbers. The number associated with an action may express the length of the operation or the figure associated with the number. And that is very clear. Here, the day-year principle is to be applied when the event described suggests points of starting and ending and can match the fulfillment of the event prophesied or has been contextually suggested. The point is that when you want to use the day-year principle in you know, uh, Revelation, as found in um, Genesis, Numbers, Ezekiel, and if you want, even Daniel, and in these contexts, you see that as a clear statement that this time is allotted for this activity and is beginning this time and is ending at this time. And that's very clear. So context must suggest that this number is intended to communicate the beginning and end of an action, but not to summarily describe the activity or identify the kind of person that is to perform an action. So the difference has been made clear and the context should guide us to determine whether a day-year principle can be applied or not. Now, let's look at the literary issues, some issues that are very important to guide us as we interpret Revelation. And these are literal. Literary simply means written, the way of writing in Revelation. Um, it can help us to understand and interpret Revelation well. The visions are presented in some literary fashions. Now, identifying these literary fashions can be helpful in interpreting the book for the contemporary reader. These include, literary fashions here include springboard passages, identification description pattern, dramatic visionary character's role, I heard, I saw pattern, repetition of the same event with different images and structure. Let's begin with the springboard passages. Springboard passages are statements that express the author's intention for a subsequent visionary drama. So what does the author intend to develop? So before he develops anything, he hints at it in a passage and later on uh, develops the idea. And so, for example, let's take this for example, Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. So 1, verse 20 reads, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sowest in my right hand and the seven golden canisters. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven canisters which thou sowest are the seven churches. That is it. Now, in chapters 2 to 3, the seven stars 
and the seven golden stars are mentioned in detail and a message or messages are sent to these seven golden stars through the seven stars. And so that's what you find. So they are hinted in chapter 1 verse 20 and well developed in chapters 2 to 3. And so, and so that's how a springboard passage statement works in Revelation. It's hinted, it's developed in later uh, vision. So you can read these to appreciate the point that we are making here. And so when you read chapter 3, verse 21, we find that to him that overcometh will I grant to him to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and I'm sat down with my father in his throne. Now in chapters 4 to 7, we see Jesus seated on the throne because it is stated that he overcame. And so that point that is made in chapter 3, verse 21, is further developed in chapters 4 to 7. And the saints are also invited to auto sit with Jesus. Chapter 6, verses 16 to 17, also makes clear that, And he said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the, of the, of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? That's the question. Who shall be able to stand? Now, chapter 7 is going to explain and develop uh, these verses further by saying that only the one for the four will be able to stand. Chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, also uh, mention that, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, how holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so we see that the same idea is presented in chapter 8, where the saints offered prayer and their prayers are heard, and therefore judgment uh, comes upon the wicked. And so that is a, a, a springboard passage. So what, what is mentioned in chapter 6, verse 9 to 10, briefly, is well expanded in uh, chapter 8. Chapter 11, verse 18, 11 verse 18 also reads, and the nations were angry, and their wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that they should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And so what you, when you read chapters 12 to chapters 25, the picture we find is that judgment is now visited on the wicked, because that was the request. That was made in chapter 11, verse 18. Chapter 12, verse 7 also reads, And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels. Now, when you read chapters um, 13 to 14, you see that the war is taken down here, and the end of the perpetrators of evil um, is assured. Chapter 15, verse 2 to 4. And here also we read, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the house of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name. For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgment are made manifest. So this are... Now, chapter 17, verse 16, we find this statement, and it's very interesting. It says, And the ten horns which thou sowest upon the beast, thee shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate, and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. And burn her with fire. That statement is made briefly. But when you read chapter 18, the entire chapter, you see that Babylon, this woman, is burnt with fire. It was hinted in chapter 17, verse 16, but a whole chapter is dedicated to expand that uh, you know, activity of burning. And so that's what we mean by springboard passage. Yeah. It's a way of writing that uh, the author employed 
so that you can see connections between passages so that you don't interpret them as different events. You see, you see them as referring to um, one event. The next one is identification description pattern. This is a strategy that the author used to help with interpretation. What this means is that a figure is identified. You don't know the person or the figure, but a little description of that figure will help you to know who that figure is. And so, for example, we have God the Father identified as one who is, was, and coming, and described as the creator when you read chapter 4, verse 8, chapter 11, verse 17. That if you only read one who is, who was, who is coming, you will never know who this person is. But when you read further, in other references, other passages, you see that he described as the creator. And so it means it points to God the Father. Now, the seven spirits are identified, they are only identified, mentioned, and later on described with ministerial responsibilities. In other words, they serve the church or the churches, and they serve the world. They go around to, you know, um, uh, preach the word. And so the resurrected Jesus identified in Revelation chapter 1, verses 9 to 20, and his roles described in the subsequent vision in chapters 2 to 3. And that helps us to know that indeed he is the Christ. Because the way he's identified in chapter 1, verses 9 to 20, not so clear. But once we look at the uh, description or the roles described, then we see that oh, indeed he is Jesus. Now the Lamb Jesus identified in chapter 5 as Lamb only and described in his role in the opening of the seals in chapter 6 to 8. And that tells us that indeed is Jesus. It's not only a lamb, it's Jesus. The two witnesses are identified in chapter 11, verses 3 to 6, with their roles described in chapter 11, verses 7 to 13. If you appreciate this principle of identification and description, you understand and uh, appreciate the meaning of these figures that are identified and later on described. The dragon and the sea beast are identified as historical figures and they are roles described for the end time battle. So you can actually see who these people are or who these figures are as they are described. The next item is different characters and images such as candlesticks. Stars, locust, lamp, dragon, woman, four living creatures, 24 elders, sea and land beasts, and the like, employed in the visionary scenes of the book, may be called dramatic visionary characters. We have mentioned this, but we want to uh, restate it because it's important. And we are saying that the figures you see, uh, images you see in Revelation, do not correspond to uh, reality in terms of forms, how they appear in, 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 in their real forms. By dramatic visionary characters, we mean that they may not exist in this form in reality, but may exist in their form not known to us as humans. But their description is to paint almost strange but familiar characters that share the identity of the earthly and the otherworldly creatures for dramatic effect. Like we said, Jesus appeared in the messages to the seven churches as as, as a human, he appears as son of, son, of, son of man. And then in chapter 4, he appears as a lamb. And, and, and it doesn't make sense in the vision. And so the point is that we should not see what we see as this is the form that you see when you go to heaven or when you go to uh, the space in which this vision is captured. What we shouldn't miss is their roles in the drama their roles, what they are doing in the visionary scenes should be the concern. The next one is I heard and I saw a pattern. And this consists of a literary strategy where the author first hears a description of a figure and sees in reality what he had heard. In short, what he hears and sees points to the same entity. And so, for example, John hears this. Let's read Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. 
read chapter 1 verse 10. John hears, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of trumpet. What he heard was a great voice. Now, now when he turned, verses 12 to 13, and I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paths with a golden girdle. And so what he heard, trumpet, he turned, he saw one like Son of Man. And the two point to the same entity, but the imagery is different. The symbols used are different. And the same also is found in chapter 5 verse 5 and chapter 5 verse 6, chapter 7 verse 4, chapter 7 verse 9, chapter 17 verse 1, chapter 17 verses 3, 15, chapter 21 verse 9, chapter 21 verses um, 10 to 11. So what he hears and what he uh, sees essentially point to the same thing. And so that's the point we want to stress here. Parallel structure of different events. This fifth point is important because we're going to look at how the book of Revelation um, uh, is arranged and some patterns that can be observed. Now, we have repetitive structures of some events run in parallel fashion. For example, the seven seals and the seven trumpets are different in meanings but occur within the same time frame from the apostolic era to the end time. They are arranged in groups of four and three with interludes between the seas and the seventh and paint the saints as being on earth. These features are not observed in the seven last plagues. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, they are grouped in fours and threes. What I mean is that the first four seals are characteristically different in appearance from the last three seals. The first four trumpets are characteristically different in appearance and force and even meaning from the last three trumpets. And the seas and the seven seals have interlude. There's a, there's, a, there's a break there, interlude. There's a pause there. The same is found between the seas and the seventh trumpet. So you can see that the seals and the trumpets run in parallel fashion. And so they follow the same timeline in terms of their fulfillment. But when it comes to the seven last plagues, no, they are different. There are no interludes and the structure does not follow that of the seals and the trumpets. That's the point you are making. Good. The next one is still under the fifth point, is the repetitive structures of same events occur from less detail to more detailed fashion with different images. And so the author uses different images, different symbolic images, to paint a particular event. So one single event has two or three images talking about the same event for emphasis and also to give different perspectives so that the meaning can be well appreciated from different perspectives. And so that's what you find. And we see this one as very dramatic. And so as we interpret Revelation, you must be very careful and appreciate. For example, we look at chapter 14, verses 14 to 20. You see the harvest. The harvest idea is used to communicate God's judgment. Now, when God judges the wicked using the wine press imagery, judgment is done. However, we see also that judgment is carried on in chapters 15 to 16, chapter 17, chapter 18, chapter 19, chapter 20. The same judgment is repeated with different brushes. And so that's the point we want to uh, address here. And as we go into the book, we'll try to bring this out more colorfully. Note, Daniel's presentation of the successive kingdoms in chapters 2, 7, 8, with different images, so just a kind of multiple imagery style for one kind of event for dramatic effects and purposes. We know that when we read, we read Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, uh, chapter 7, chapter 8, the picture of world kingdoms uh, is presented from different angles, using different images, statues, animals, different kinds of animals. 
Of course, each chapter has a focus, but you can appreciate that you know each chapter has some details that um, the other chapters do not. But the whole idea is worldly kingdoms cannot stand God's kingdom. That's the whole point. But they are painted with different brushes, making the same point. And this point should not be missed. In other words, a multiple imagery style is a literary way of writing. It's a way of writing to communicate a message. And so we should not miss this uh, style of writing in, in Revelation as we interpret Revelation. For example, Ezekiel presents judgment or situation of Israel, Babylon, Egypt, Ty, and their leaders respectfully with different imageries. When you read Ezekiel chapters 4 to 39, this point is well demonstrated. Note here that Jesus employs different imageries in his parables about a theme, the kingdom of God. And Jesus use, uh, you know, uh, fish, we use uh, seeds, we use uh, coins, we use different things just to talk about the same thing, the importance of appreciating um, the kingdom of God. And that is what we are stressing here. The sixth point about literary issues is structure. Structure refers to the arrangement of the vision to communicate the message or messages of the book. Apart from the prologue, that is the introduction of this book, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 to 8, and the epilogue, the conclusion, chapters 22, verses 6 to 21, the following three-fold structure of Revelation is broadly informative. A. Messages to the seven churches, and Christ is seen here as a high priest. Opening of the seal scroll, Christ is seen here as an eschatological ruler. Content of the seal scroll, Christ is seen here as an apocalyptic Michael. The immediate literary structure for interpretation may be captured through the Christological gospel frame. We want to propose another structure, another way of reading Revelation, based on the approach that we have adopted, the Christological gospel approach. We are approaching this book through the lens of Jesus' ministry, his nature, and what he has done for humanity. Because the book says, Revelation of Jesus Christ. And so that's how we are going to go about it. And it's very simple. Our presentation will be done following this outline. Living the Gospel, chapters 1 to 3. The cost and the character of the Gospel, chapters 4 to 5. The spread and the cost of the Gospel, chapter 6 to 7. The cost of the rejection of the Gospel, chapters 8 to 11. The background for the hatred for the Gospel and its Ultimate Consequence, chapters 12 to 14. The dramatization of God's judgment on the human agents as enemies of the gospel, chapters 15 to 16. The dramatization of God's judgment on the humans, political powers, and beasts as enemies of the gospel, chapters 17 and 18. The dramatization of God's judgment on the dragon as the enemy of the gospel, chapters 19 to 20. Now, that will be our presentation, verse-by-verse verse analysis of the book of Revelation. We believe you have been blessed with these hermeneutical principles, guidelines that we have given you as you interpret scripture, as we guide you to interpret Revelation in particular, and we believe that you're going to be a blessing. As we begin this presentation, I urge you to let your Bible be with you and go through whatever verse that you present and will be a blessing. Thank you very much for staying with us up to this point. And if you are yet to be a member, be a member by subscribing to this channel. Share this message with the world and be a blessing. Thank you and see you. Be watchful and brave.